Hello, Sean. Good morning. <laughs> How are you? I'm well, thank you. Yes. Uh, maybe you want to introduce yourself and uh, just tell us a little bit more about Cleveland. Well, sure. Thank you. So I'm a Strata property lawyer, which means that I deal with all the legal issues that Strata corporations face day in, day out. And those can be from drafting bylaws to collecting money to answering questions about uh, Personal Information Protection Act. Um, I've been doing this for 20 plus years and have never been bored. <laughs> And you guys are currently located in White Rock? We are, but we serve Stratus throughout the whole province. Perfect. Uh, okay, do you have your uh, slide deck? I ready? do. Me... We'll see if this uh, works. Yeah, I see it there. Perfect. I'll let you begin. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so, all the title of the presentation was Handling Personal Information in a Digital World. Uh, I'm not. Um, overly techie. So what we're really going to talk about is the, the obligations of the Strata Corporation to comply with the Personal Information Protection Act. Um, and so I have talked a little bit about you know who we are. So I'll just jump into talking about the Personal Information Protection Act. Uh, I'm going to start just talking generally about the act, um, setting the background. Then we're going to look at applying it in particular circumstances, um, some of which will involve digital things such as video surveillance and FOB access systems. So there are more than just the Strata Property Act for Strata corporations to worry about. Uh, there's the Human Rights Code, uh, and there's also the Personal Information Protection Act, which shorthand we refer to it as PIPA. So uh, as throughout the presentation, you'll see that I say PIPA, that's what it stands for. PIPA governs the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information by organizations, and that includes strata corporations. Which leads to the question, what is personal information? So it's information about an identifiable individual. I've included the whole definition from the act, but it's really that first bold point that we're focusing on. Um, and so it's anything that relates specifically to an individual. So some very obvious things like your name is personal information, your age, your appearance, uh, but other things connected to you, like your email address or uh, your phone number, or even in a strata setting sometimes uh, what pets you have or what uh, license plate number of your car, bank account information. All of that is personal information because it connects directly to you. So in order to collect, use, or disclose an individual's person, personal information, the strata has to um, comply with certain requirements of PIPA. So just pause for a moment. We'll talk about what we mean by collect, use, or disclose. So collect is to gather. When you're asking someone for information, personal information, you have to uh, have their, their consent or statutory exemption to do that. The same with using it. So using it can be is viewed of what are you going to do with it? Why are you collecting it? What do you intend uh, to do with that information? And then, of course, disclosing it is who are you going to give it to and why? So in order to do any of those things, you have to have an individual's consent. So that could be express consent, uh, implied consent, or there are some statutory exemptions. And we'll talk about each of those. Um, the bottom underlying factor is an organization has to disclose to the individual verbally or in writing the purposes for the collection, use, uh, and disclosure of the information. So somewhere you have to know why, why the strata is asking for what it's asking for. Express consent is relatively straightforward. It'll be something like, you know, a tick this box if you want to receive uh, emails in a strata setting. Again, it may be you tick this box if you want to uh, receive emails from the uh, social committee. Um, when you provide, when you fill out your pre-authorized payment form, you're giving express consent to the strata to use that to collect money. Implied consent is a little bit trickier, but it happens quite a lot. Um, so imply, implicit consent or implied consent, it's sort of 
you think about it, the opt out um, uh, scenario. So an organization has to provide notice of its intention to collect, use and disclose uh, information and then provide a reasonable opportunity for the person to decline, either not to provide it or to opt out. If the person doesn't uh, decline or doesn't opt out, then the strata has consent uh, to use that you know, information for the purposes that it's uh, disclosed, that it's going to use them for. There are also some ex statutory exemptions when consent isn't required. So those are set out in sections 12, 15, and 18 of PIPA. And each of those sections relates to a different different part of the spectrum collection use disclosure. I didn't list them all because there's quite a few exemptions, but some of the more common ones are you can use or disclose someone's personal information if it's in the best interests of the individual and their consent can't be obtained in a timely way. Uh, so perhaps you're know, contacting a next of kin in an emergency. Uh, the use uh, or collection use disclosure is authorized by law. So there's a law or uh, in the case of a strata bylaw that authorizes that use. It's information available from a pub public source. So if your phone number is publicly listed, uh, then it's it's not, uh, there's no need to get your consent to use it to call you. Or um, disclosures to a lawyer representing the organization. So if a strata needs advice, they can provide personal information about the owner's tenants occupants to the lawyer for the purposes of getting that advice. Section 23 of PIPA is another provision that uh, stratas need to be aware of. And so on the request of an individual, an organization must provide to that individual certain things. Um, one of those is all of that individual's personal information that's under the control of the organization. So do you have that, oh, that person's name, their phone number, their email address? What do you have about them in your records? that is personal to them. Um, the ways in which it's been used and also who it's been disclosed to. Um, and so I think most strata corporations uh, would not be in a position to readily answer those questions. So when we think about document management, um, those are things that stratas need to take into consideration. They have to be able to answer the, those questions. Um, for example, who's made a request to see correspondence that you've sent into the strata. PIPA also sets out some requirements for all organizations, in, including stratas, uh, to meet. So one of those is it has to make reasonable security arrangements to prevent unauthorized access and use uh, to of that information. So I came just in on, on the tail end of um, the Power Strata presentation. Uh, so that would be a good example. You know, is your system where you're storing your documents, is that secure? Who has access to it? Can anyone get in there? Is a password protected? If you're still keeping paper uh, records, is it in a locked file cabinet? Um, who has access? How are those going to be protected? And for council members, think about when you're at home. Have you printed things off? Are they sitting on your desk? Um, who's going to be able to see or access that information? Because these obligations apply not just to the corporate entity, but to the officers and directors of the entity. Um, Take reasonable steps to ensure the accuracy of the information. Uh, so if you're recording something about somebody, how accurate is it? Um, do you have their phone number right? Uh, you have to allow access upon their to that information on requests. So that goes back to what we just talked about, about Section 23. And then you have to establish a policy for how you're going to manage that information. And then you have to appoint a privacy officer. So that person's job is basically to monitor compliance with people requirements and deal with requests uh, under Section 23. And so those duties have are not only set out in the legislation, they've been underscored by the Civil Resolution Tribunal in uh, in this uh, particular case. Uh, so in this case, dealt with the duties of stratas and it was confirmed that you know one of the uh, one of the duties under the Strata Pro Property Act is to comply with PIPA. 
So what are some ways in which strata corporations collect personal information? Um, because you may think, well, gee, do we really? Well, in fact, you actually collect a lot of information about people. So anytime somebody fills out a form, whether it's contact info form or pre-authorized debit form or vehicle registration, clubhouse rental form, you're getting personal information about that that uh, individual. Everything from their name to their uh, license plate number to their email address uh, through their bank account information. Uh, Stratas also collect information required under a bylaw. So under the standard bylaws, owners and tenants are required to provide certain information uh, upon uh, moving in. Many stratas expand that in terms of uh, bylaws and, uh, and rules. Pet uh, registration bylaws might be an example. You're giving information about what pet, what pet you own. Um, correspondence is a common example. Uh, there's going to be letters and emails to the strata talking about things that uh, your neighbor did if you're writing in a complaint letter, requests that people are making for alterations or requests perhaps even for a, for a therapy dog. Um, all of that, if it relates to an individual, is personal information. Video surveillance system and electronic fob access systems also collect personal information. We're going to spend a bit of time in a few minutes just looking at those. And also when you attend a meeting, um, you're being recorded that you are at that meeting, in particular a council meeting where they list uh, the people who have showed up. And that list is by no means exhaustive, but those are sort of the common examples and ways in which Strata collects personal information, which then ties into its obligation to know uh, or have consent to collect, use, and disclose it. And so then again, that's just a list uh, that I've already sort of touched on about the type of information that stratas uh, collect from their residents. So under PIPA, you're not allowed just to ask for anything from anybody for whatever reason. Uh, the request has to be reasonable. So would a reasonable consider person consider it reasonable to be asking for that information? So in, in the case that I've cited below, uh, they were collecting information from people uh, who were using units for short-term accommodation. They're taking uh, it was copies of driver's licenses and all sorts of in information and the privacy uh, well, there's a challenge uh, under CRT went to the Supreme Court, and in the end, the decision was that that information exceeded PIPA because there wasn't a reason uh, for collecting it. So think about why you're requesting information from owners and why. Be prepared to justify it if there's ever a challenge. And you can't ask for more than is necessary. So that ties into why are we asking for it? In order to achieve a purpose, are we getting only what we need to achieve that purpose? The Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner is who actually governs PIPA and deals with complaints uh, where there's been a failure to comply with PIPA. Uh, so they've produced some guidance documents on a number of uh, different topics because people applies to all organizations of every um, stripe and color. Um, the strata one, they have a guidance document, privacy guidelines for strata corporations and strata agents. So that's a good thing uh, for both strata managers and strata councils to have handy uh, as a quick uh, reference when dealing with PIPA issues. So now that we've uh, laid the groundwork, we're going to touch on some of the um, ways in which PIPA applies uh, practically to stratas. Uh, and email is one of the things, uh, thinking about uh, in a digital world, we now have digital communication. It's a primary means of, of communicating uh, between owners and strata managers, strata council members. Um, it's the primary way in which we all we all communicate between each other. It's correspondence under Section 35 of the Act, and I know later there's going to be a talk on uh, documents uh, under Section 35, so I'm not going to uh, go there in detail. But this begs the question, how are you managing all of that email correspondence? Uh, how are you 
recording it for Section 35, and more importantly for PIPA, how are you making sure that it's protected from access? Because it's going to contain personal information about people, starting with the fact that you have their email address. That's personal information. Um, and sorry, I'm just going to pop back just one slide. Also, in terms of how is it managed, think back to Section 23 and the ability of an owner to request what personal information the strata has and who it's been disclosed to. Uh, how are you going to meet that in terms of tracking email correspondence? Uh, an email. Um, we all you know often we have shared email accounts at at our house um are we using that for strata business and think then how people applies to that so the email that you as a council member are using for strata business do you share it with your family um who else has it uh is access just a click of click of an icon on your laptop or is it password protected if you're printing them off, um, what are you doing with them? You're just leaving them about. And then how are you permanently saving them? Because at the end of the day, you have an obligation to protect that information, and then you have an obligation to make it available if somebody asks. Video surveillance. Uh, when I first uh, heard about, about the topic in the digital world, this is the very first thing that popped to mind uh, because there's a lot more video surveillance uh, occurring now within Stratas than there ever was. So if you're operating a video surveillance or a FOB system, uh, those are going to be subject to PIPA. So when I mean about a FOB system, it are the systems where you have the magnetic card, you swipe it and it lets you in and out of the building. Um, in order for it to let you in the building, it's got to confirm first of all, that that, uh, that FOB is, um, is valid. Those FOBs are often given a number and then tied to a particular uh, straddle lot. More sophisticated buildings use them throughout for access to amenities, to elevators, and some of the systems, in fact, record when the card is swiped and in what location. So both of those systems collect personal information because you're recording when people enter and leave a building, uh, when they access certain areas of the building, and what they do when they're on the common property. So the latter is really particular to video surveillance. Um, as you're walking through, the, through a surveilled area, anyone looking at that can see uh, whether you're carrying groceries, are you um, hiding something in the trunk of your car, what, what are you doing? They're, it's information about you. Um, and then this was a case we're going to talk about in a moment, ICON 1 or 2. It's a decision from the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner that dealt in quite a bit of detail with respect to video surveillance and FOB systems. Uh, and so in that case, the Privacy Commissioner detailed some of the things that video surveillance captures. Um, and, you know, and so you can see it's details about your appearance, uh, activities, behavior, who you're coming in and out of the building with, and then again, patterns of arrival and departure. And that's why video surveillance is really um, sensitive when it comes to the issue of PIPA. The Privacy Commissioner set some basic requirements for video surveillance. So you can't just operate a system because you want a system and you can't just surveil every area uh, that you want to surveil. You have to uh, give a bit of a, a thoughtful analysis. Um, you have to justify why you need to operate a system beyond just we we live in a you know in in a rough neighborhood. Um, have you had break-ins? Have you had problems? What else have you tried to do? Uh, that's less invasive than uh, than putting in a video surveillance system. And then is it reasonable to record the area? Uh, so maybe it is uh, reasonable to record exterior access. Do you really need to record what goes on in the hallways inside the building? So these are all things that you need to think about if you're going to put in or operate uh, an existing video surveillance system. Uh, when you're Going down this path, you have to identify the detailed purposes uh, for the surveillance in each area. So what are you attempting to achieve? Uh, 
You have to pass a bylaw authorizing the use of the system and preferably stating the purposes uh, for which the, uh, the system is going to be used. The privacy policy uh, does not need to be in the bylaw. It can be a separate standalone document. It details who has access, um, how long it's stored for, um, where the cameras are located, etc. That's a document that would be available to owners I like it outside of the bylaw uh, because it makes it easier to change should you need to tinker any with any of those things. And you're also required to put up signage alerting people to the use of the video surveillance system so that they can decide if they're going to enter the building uh, that uh, they don't want to be surveilled. There have been a couple uh, decisions of the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner uh, with respect to um, video surveillance. The first one was uh, a number of years ago, the Shoal Point decision. And uh, what came out of that was that you cannot sit down um, on a Sunday afternoon because there's nothing good on TV and look through the video footage looking for violations. Um, only if the strata receives a, a bylaw complaint or if there were a break-in or some uh, incident can it go back and look at the video surveillance. The footage can all, also only be used in relation to serious bylaw uh, violations. So if there's some muddy footprints in the lobby, you can't go surfing through the footage looking for that. The other thing it said is that you cannot have a live feed viewable by residents. So in that particular case, anyone in the building could click onto the uh, video surveillance system and watch what people were doing. Uh, that's not permitted. The other case uh, I mentioned earlier, Icon 1 or 2, it uh, really looked at a lot of detailed um, things with respect to video surveillance. In the interest of time, we're not going to go through them all. Uh, but just setting the stage, uh, this was a fairly, uh, let's say, digitally sophisticated building. Uh, it's, they had video surveillance in 18 internal and 10 external locations. Uh, so they, they surveilled a lot of the building. One of the areas was the entrance to the gym, swimming pool, hot tub area. Uh, and the others were the parking garage, exterior doors in the alley, et cetera. They also had a fairly sophisticated FOB system. It controlled 30 access points throughout the building. So you can see there is a lot of digital information, personal information collected by this particular strata. There's an owner in the strata who didn't like the way it was all being dealt with, thought that they were uh, collecting too much, and that resulted in the complaint to the privacy commissioner. The video surveillance, uh, the strata said they were using it for a number of things. They would routinely monitor it for minor bylaw infractions, um, garbage disposal, discarding cigarette butts, and uh, they had a real problem with short-term accommodation use. And so in this case, uh, the, the concierge, this building, uh, big enough to have one, would, uh, in between their other duties, sit there and watch the live footage and see if it could catch anyone. They also said that they used it to prevent, detect, and investigate break-ins, prevent to damage, and to ensure the safety of owners and residents provide emergency first aid. The last was the justification for why they were surveilling the, uh, the hot tub in the gym. Uh, ICON also made clear that notification could be through the bylaw or the signage. And then the uses to which the system could be Put, depended very much on the wording of the bylaw that was in place or the signage. So this was uh, the best example. The, the strata said that it was ensure, use the video surveillance to ensure safety of the complex owners, tenants, occupants, and visitors. Uh, but they used it on, the, that's what they said on paper. You'll recall a couple of slides ago when we looked at their, what they said, they said they used it to provide emergency aid to owners. The first did not justify the second. So this goes back to thinking about very carefully, what are you using it for uh, and why, and making sure that that's properly recorded in the, in the documentation. Uh, in the end, the Privacy Commissioner didn't like the scope of what uh, they were surveilling and ordered the strata to cut it down. They could only uh, use it to enforce garbage disposal bylaws. Uh, they had a huge problem with people just throwing garbage everywhere and to prevent and investigate property damage in the parkade. 
it could not be operated in any other aspect of the building because there is no evidence to show that there is a problem that needed to be addressed. Uh, so again, with respect to the gym, no one had ever uh, collapsed while using uh, the exercise equipment nor uh, drowned in the pool. So there was no justification to surveil people coming in and out in their gym clothes, bathing suits, et cetera. Owner-operated systems uh, are also becoming more common within stratas. Uh, so starting with the minimum of a doorbell camera, all the way up to some owners like to put surveillance outside uh, their, uh, their units. Uh, the Civil Resolution Tribunal uh, has looked at this issue and uh, said that um, Stratas have to have a PIPA policy in place in order uh, for owners to uh, put up uh, cameras. Uh, so absent of bylaw, individual can cameras can't be authorized. Um, those decisions were made in the context of orders being sought to remove cameras. Uh, but ultimately, it's the Privacy Commissioner who decides whether or not that's the case. Um, I always like to present an alternate view um, with respect to the CRT, I'm not entirely sure those decisions are correct under PIPA uh, because PIPA defines an organization and it expressly excludes individuals acting in their personal or domestic capacity. Um, and then there, so owner systems are not operated by the strata, they're operated by owners. And then there's some support for that in the foot case. Uh, I always recommend my strata if you're going to allow owner systems, it's best to have a bylaw that regulates uh, those. Uh, but if you're looking to allow owner systems, uh, best to seek some legal advice uh, with respect to reconciling these two differing views. ICON also looked at FOB systems. Uh, so you recall the FOB was used to track uh, people's movements. And in fact, the strata in that case used it to close down elevator access where they thought people were violating rules. Um, the privacy commissioner didn't like that. Um, basically, it's okay to gather personal information to connect the FOB to the, uh, to the particular owner, but in this case, gathering any more data was not permitted. Um, so in fact, the strata was not allowed to track where the FOBs were used and when, um, unless it could show a need to do that. Uh, and then uh, using FOB data would only be, has to be considered appropriate from the perspective of a reasonable person. Um, so if you are going to use it, uh, you need to have, a, it has to be a fairly severe situation. You have to think about whether it's reasonable to collect that and use it. You can't just collect it and use it for any and every purpose. So based on the ICON decision, if you're operating a FOB system, um, understand what your system does and how it operates, determine what it collects, consider why that information is needed to be collected, determine if collecting it complies with PIPA, determine if using it complies with PIPA, and then adapt your bylaw and privacy policy accordingly. Uh, so if you are recording a, when people come and go in certain parts of the building, why are you doing that? what's the need for it. And if you are going to do it for a particular reason, uh, then make sure that that purpose is set out in the bylaws and the privacy policy. On that similar note, I often get asked, can we use video and FOB data for bylaw enforcement? Um, so certainly if you're going to, there should be a bylaw uh, that uh, authorizes uh, you to do that and the situations in which you're doing it. So serious bylaw violations. And so I try and define those in the bylaws that I use. Uh, if you collect it though without proper authorization, you can certainly use it in a CRT proceeding. There's no prohibition of common law against using illegally obtained evidence, but beware that could readily result in a PIPA complaint. And then you're going to have to explain why you collected, used and disclosed that information information without proper authorization. I'm just looking at the time. So I wanted to allow just a few minutes for questions. Um, so I won't, I'm uh, just going to touch on, on meetings, but we won't, uh, won't do that unless there aren't any questions. 
Yes, it looks like there's quite a few questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can extend a little bit into lunch because you're the the last one before lunch. So uh, it's I'll, up to uh, you, right? I'll let you uh, okay. let decide. <laughs> All right. Um, well, maybe then if I'm just going to nudge in, into lunch, I'll yeah. just quickly talk about um, two other other things where people uh, applies. Uh, so recording meetings. Um, the general, uh, the, the view under the, the guidance document is that you either need a bylaw that permits um, participants to record uh, a motion passed by majority vote or everybody in the meeting consents. So generally, um, it should be uh, discouraged if you're using electronic meeting platforms, make sure that's uh, turned off. And I actually pass the bylaw on the bylaws that I draft that just prohibits it outright. So the strata can uh, have some ability to better enforce that. Um, minutes was the other thing I was just going to talk about in terms of PIPA. Uh, just quickly think about what you've got in the minutes. Um, don't be putting personal information about people in in the minutes um, minutes record basically the decisions that were made you don't need to have a discussion about all the details i often get asked is a unit number or a strata lot uh, number is that personal information that's not so when we're recording things in the minutes uh, you can use unit numbers uh, strata lot numbers but not people's uh, not people's names uh, and then uh, I will let uh, the presenters this afternoon that deal with documents to talk about PIPA and document uh, disclosure. So turning to the questions, I think those are in, are they in the chat here, Ryan? Correct. Okay. So here's one, can a strata corporation give out accounts receivable list that shows the names of the owners? Uh, so I said I wasn't going to talk about documents and people, but I guess I will. Um, so under Section 35 of the Act, strata keeps documents. Um, and accounts receivable list is one of those. It's part of the books of account. Section 36 allows owners to request anything listed in Section 35. So one of the questions that arises is, does PIPA apply to document disclosure? Um, and the answer to that is no, you don't have to redact any of the information or protect people's information when it comes to a document request under Section 36. That's because Section 36 is, is disclosure authorized by law. Uh, so the, the CRT has looked at this a number of occasions and has said the stratas don't need to request redact documents um, when they're requested. So if somebody asks for the accounts receivable list, the strata can give it with the owner's names. If Similarly, if someone asks for copies of correspondence, we don't redact those. Um, so another good question, can a strata corporation forward an owner's email to a contractor to do work? Uh, where the owner is requested without obtaining consent from the owner who sent the email. Um, so that raises, do you have implied consent? Um, or if not, then you need express consent. So somewhere in the conversation, if the counselor said, yeah, we'll contact um, the plumber and we'll give them your contact information uh, so they can connect with you, and that owner hasn't said back, written back and said, no, please don't do that, then I would say you'd have um, implied consent. But otherwise, you shouldn't just be forwarding off email addresses or cell phone numbers without uh, without an owner's consent. Uh, lots of good questions. So I'm just trying to see... Um, yeah, quite a flood. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, so, a couple questions here: emails between council members um, are they? Do they fall um, under PIPA in Section thirty-five? So they're not correspondence for the purposes of Section thirty-five, but they may still contain people's personal information. So, if you're all emailing as a council amongst each other uh, with respect to a certain problematic owner, um, and sadly, we all seem to have those, um, 
you may you don't need to keep those discussions as part of section 35 but you need to make sure that the details in that those emails are protected so don't print them out and leave them where other people can find them chuck them in in, in the general recycling um you know again is it a shared email box I think pipa applies in that respect A uh, good question, what should be done when uh, someone erroneously CCs all owners in a communication? Um, so if there is a privacy breach, so whether you've accidentally disclosed people's information or somebody hacked in and got it, PIPA does have requirements for you know, disclosing that, dealing with it. Uh, so you'd want to get some legal advice with respect to what to do in that particular situation. Um, Uh, yes, a good question. We are a small strata such that strata numbers discloses the owners and, and, and tenants. Um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, I've always wondered at that myself, um, because if you say it's Unit 101, everyone knows who's in Unit 101. But we, generally speaking, that's fine, because we're talking about, so if you, let's use an example, if you put in the minutes, the strata council decided to impose a fine against Unit 101. That's all right, because we're talking about a charge that's been levied against a unit. We're not talking about necessarily the details of why that fine arose, um, and and that's fine. But uh, you know, I, I don't have, don't think there's an issue even in a small strata with using unit numbers or strata law numbers. Uh, we'll take just a few more questions there, uh, and I just want to remind everyone that any of your questions that are submitted, we are going to try and follow up um, with additional podcasts or newsletter, uh, so don't worry about your questions uh, going fully unanswered. Uh, we're going to do our best to make sure everyone's uh, questions do get answered at some point, okay? Yeah. Um... Maybe I'll just <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll just take 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 the take mm -hmm. this last one here. What about complaints when someone doesn't want retaliation? Um, so unfortunately, if you write in about about your neighbor and and uh, complain about something they've done, they are entitled to request that doc that letter or email under section. Uh, 36 and the case law very clearly says it's not to be redacted um, so the strata's hands are somewhat tied so if you uh you know are sending in a complaint i think you need to be cognizant of the fact that that someone may know about that i actually explicitly put that in the privacy policies i prepare so that people are notified that uh, if you send this in understand that we may be required to disclose it to anyone who who requests it um, on, on one thing I should say about Section 36 in PIPA is it doesn't authorize council passing out documents with personal information where there has been no request by someone. Um, so if, if you wanted to hand out uh, the AR list just for reference at the general meeting, you would have to redact everyone's uh, names, email addresses, et cetera, because no one's requested it. It's council volunteering. And in that case, people would apply. Um, and then maybe I'll just answer the last one, a couple about sure. doorbell ca cameras. I know I kind of oh, yes. um, sped, <laughs> sped, sped through, through that. <laughs> Quickly, um, I always realize at the end of the presentation I should have cut it in half. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's lots of good, good info. <laughs> so, doorbell cameras are are. Um, so I, I I talked about the CRT decisions and and they largely dealt with. Um, issues of people you know making alterations of fixing cameras or or uh, you know do doing things. So the CRT said well. Largely, putting up a video surveillance system is a uh, is an alteration, and then you know Strata should have have a peep of policy. Um, setting those those aside for a sec, if it's not an alteration, if you're simply sticking in a doorbell camera, you're not cutting, you know, fixing anything or or cutting holes in 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 the door to make it bigger, um, you're not really altering anything. So you're not going to have to get permission. So an owner could do it. Um, in, 
The other issue that I've encountered over time is what does it capture? So in some of the newer town-owned complexes, uh, there's people's garages, front doors, bedrooms right across from each other. So often we get complaints about, uh, you know, while someone's filming in, you know, into my unit. Again, I think a bylaw is the best that says owners need to get permission. You need to show us where you're going to put it, uh, how it's going to, to near what it's going to record. Um, and then that helps strata to regulate it. Uh, and and make sure that there aren't PIPA problems. If you don't have that bylaw and somebody didn't make an alteration, simply put in a doorbell camera, uh, then I don't think as much strata can do about it. Awesome. Right. Thanks for uh, all your informative you're, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> presentation again there, Sean. Uh, really appreciated. And uh, uh, looks like we're still getting lots of questions coming in. <laughs> so we'll have a, a lot to talk about in a future session. Um, so this is really great. Um, and now I guess everyone can go to lunch. We're going to have a lunch break. And then when we come back, uh, we'll cover uh, some of the raffle and uh, early registration um, gifts that we're going to be giving away. Um, and then we'll get into the online dispute resolution tools uh, by the Civil Resolution Tribunal. <laughs> Thanks again, uh, Sean, for coming All and right. uh, we'll welcome. see everyone soon. <laughs>